master the business of speaking with your hosts, Taylor and Austin. You're listening to Technically Speaking. Welcome to another episode of Technically Speaking. We're your hosts, Taylor and Austin. And in today's episode, we're talking about the similarities of speaking in front of a smaller audience versus a larger audience. What are those similarities? Even what are the differences? How do you prepare for it? How do you connect with that many people, especially in a large audience? What are the differences in connection with a small and large audience, both live and digitally? We have so many questions and we are really excited to unpack that with Ronnie Lieber here today. Now, Ronnie Lieber, Lieber is a well-renowned keynote speaker, stadium host, and legacy coach from Austria who has entertained more than 5 million people live and worldwide at different major sporting events, corporate events, and seminars. And since 2021, he's spent over 1,500 hours on live TV as an anchorman and TV host. So least to say, both in the live and the digital world, Ronnie is the perfect person to help us understand what those similarities and differences are of speaking in front of a smaller audience versus a larger audience. So as always, stick around until the end for some amazing resources, and we hope you like this one. See you in there. Aha. Wow. Oh, we did it. Holy wow. cow. We Ooh. did it. Okay. Man, let's go. Look at us right. go. A little human moment for everybody listening right now. Because you get told all the time, like, oh, easy for you to say automation, because you're like the G we just struggled for five minutes to get this episode live, everybody. Holy so. crap. <laughs> but we're here now and we're here with Ronnie. Ronnie, thank you so much for being here today. It's a privilege to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Taylor, to both of you. Thank you for having me. And also, thank you for everybody listening. It's going to be worthwhile your time. <laughs> Good. <laughs> oh, man. And from Austria, nonetheless. It, you know, yes. it's a beautiful thing in 2022 that we can have a live conversation, more or less face to face, from literally opposite ends of the planet. It's beautiful thing. Pretty awesome. Yeah. So incredible. I love it. Yeah. Us too. <laughs> All right. Well, we're so excited to have this episode. Um, as our listeners know, we love to do some digging behind the scenes and find something interesting to, you know, sort of learn more about you. And you've got a very interesting backstory, just full stop. So we could start anywhere. But um, one of the things that like really stood out to us was, first of all, just like this love of sports that you have. Um, I see you've run a couple of marathons, which is inspiring to me because I'm also training for a marathon, my first one ever. So thank you for the inspiration there. Taylor's a big weightlifter. We, we were sports fans too. But we saw that you were a national like competitor or champion even for fistball. And the question that we have is, <laughs> What the hell is fistball? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, national champion, yes, with our school back then. So it was, uh, I was 14 years old and, and we were, of course, in our age range. But it was, what is fistball? I mean, uh, you know what volleyball is, I guess. Yeah. 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 And, and um, fistball is a bit similar, although you do not have a net. You have a line. And at the same time, you're not allowed to open your fist. So you need to be, like, you need to play with, with your fist. Either you can hit the ball like with the, with the fist uh, on the side like a smash, or uh, or you you hit it with your upper uh, with your lower arm, basically. But um, and and but and the ball the ball can touch the the ground between every uh -huh. player, in a way. Oh wow, fascinating! Wow. So if the ball can touch the ground, like what's the? How do you get a point or something? Okay, well, it can touch the ground once. So if oh. it touches the ground more than once, then it's uh, it's it's a point. Wow! Thanks for the fun. clarification. Yeah, I, I want to try it. it. That's awesome. for real. Yeah, I'm gonna have to start a league uh, here. It was <laughs> fun. Yeah, that's rad. Well, man, holy cow! And on top of fistball, uh, you uh, are like oh, also what we read is like one of like just over a hundred Tony Robbins trainers. Is that right? Exactly. Uh, no fistball. I didn't even know he had a there. training program. That's crazy. <laughs> What's that? I said I didn't even know he had like trainers. Like I the first first time I read about it. Like what? How did that all come to be? Well, actually, um, I've been in a Tony Robbins environment for more than half of my life. So wow. 2001 was my first Tony Robbins event that I went to. And, and maybe the one or other who, of the people who are listening right now have been to a Tony Robbins event. And I mean, there, there are huge seminars all over the world that he's doing. And um, well, uh, when I went there, and of course, like, basically, it's all about for you as a participant to get the most out of your life in different areas, depending on the seminar that you're at. 
It's about creating breakthroughs, creating wows. And, but he cannot do that alone because nowadays we have seminars or we had seminars before COVID. For example, in the United Center where the Chicago Bulls play or in the San Jose Sharks Arena in San Jose and, or in the American Airlines Center in, in Miami where the Miami Heat play and so on. So it's like really huge stadiums and he cannot do this all alone. So there are trainers there who also help and support and who also serve the participants. Like uh, there are also some other events, like maybe you, the one or the other person has watched I'm Not Your Guru on mm -hmm. Netflix, the, the Tony Robbins documentary. And th that's a Date with Destiny program. That's the name of the program. And there are also trainers who lead a team. So basically every, every team has a trainer and I'm one of those. Wow. So you're like actually on site working with Tony to help these attendees get the breakthroughs that they're there for. Did exactly. I hear that right? Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Do you do like breakout sessions where you're like in small groups doing like actual training? Are you doing more individual stuff and helping people along the way? Is it a mix? All of it. So All it's of it. Uh, one of the things is like uh, in a team, every morning we have a team meeting, for example. And then we, and, and of course, like we're there for a team. And now we have all of that virtual and every virtual Zoom room, so to say. Um, and, and there might be 30,000 participants. So, but they are going to be in different Zoom rooms because one Zoom room is not going to hold 30,000 people. And so every, every room is going to have a trainer as well. And, and so it's, it's really about like holding the room, being there for them. You're, you're basically the person responsible if something, if something is like that, that, you're, that the participant is being served. And on the other hand, if one of them has a breakdown or a challenge or something, then also it's, it's up to a trainer to, to work with that person one-on-one. -on -one. Wow. wow, Man. That's such a cool the model. scale of all of that is I know. mind blowing. Oh, gosh, it seems like the logistics are have got to be just intense trying to get that many yeah. people to get the value that they're for, there for and just keep everything moving, especially virtually, like trying to run 30,000 people through Zoom rooms. Like my heart gets palpitations just thinking about that. <laughs> for sure. No, it's really incredible. And I mean, to everybody who is also in the speaking industry, and uh, I mean, this is basically probably a lot of our listeners are going to be in the industry. Things have changed in the last two years a yeah. lot. And, and just being on the, on the forefront and in the trailblazing um, sight of that, of what's actually happening and going on and, and having seen that from, from basically being shut down to now being up and running basically all around the world at the same time in different time zones. Uh, so people might start actually a seminar at 11 o'clock at night and going until the next day at noon. Other people are going to start uh, maybe in the late afternoon and go until the morning and other people start in their morning and go until the evening. That's usually the U.S., but yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. That's, so that means that if you're in Austria, unless you're here in the States on site, I imagine you're probably working through the night sometimes for those events. Exactly. Like there are events where I start uh, maybe like at 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then I, I end at, uh, well, let's say like 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. Oh, um, my. I thought you were going to say <laughs> night for a second. <laughs> the morning. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Ronnie, wow. what a champion. Holy cow. Yeah. Well, I mean, it looks like too, based on your history, you're not immune to being in front of a lot of people. I mean, like, it, I mean, it's incredible. Seriously, like, go check out Ronnie's about page, you guys, the link will be in the show notes. But I mean, massive audiences, you spent, what, 1500 hours on live TV, you've also done stadium shows and giant events. Like, how did that all come to be? Like, did you always know you wanted to be in front of large audiences? Like, what was the, the journey to get into that world? Well, actually, it was never. Uh, I mean, who does that? Like, I, it right, was yeah, I, I thought this is what I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it was like, uh, who does that? How do you get that? It was not like, yeah, I want to become a host or a presenter or something at events or a stadium announcer or a ring announcer at boxing events. It was not like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Um, <laughs> I, I studied sports and economics. Like, wow. really, actually, economics was my first uh, study. And then uh, I, I also studied sports just as a hobby not even thinking that I was going to be doing something in around that field. And then uh, when I was getting done with my studies, that was in 2008, I was asking myself, well, okay, awesome. Now you're getting done, but what, are, what do you want to do now? Because before that, I was always working in different fields in different areas. I was working a few years in sales. I learned quite a few things in that area. Then I, uh, I wanted to pass on my knowledge. So I, I was working a few years in, in, in teaching people. 
So in, in education, for example, I was also like three, four years, I was educating unemployed people on how to um, like everything from sales to, to uh, purchasing, but at the same time, also how do you apply somewhere? And, but I knew that was not the end. Like I, I knew, okay, what, what now? Mm-hmm. And then I thought, well, you know, in order to, I would love to do something that I'm passionate about. Like not just something that I'm interested about, but something where I really have the passion for. I thought that's a great concept because if you're passionate about something, then you're going to be good at it or you're going to become good at it very easily because, because it's something that you just love to do without like, oh, I need to, I don't want to do it anymore or is it Friday yet or whatever. So it's really like, this is what you love to do. This is what you were born to be. Well, the only challenge I had was, what is it? Yeah, how do you like, identify what, what is that that you're passionate about? Because oftentimes peop- I, I hear people tell me like, oh, yeah, I want to do that. But I don't know what it is. And I didn't know what it is either. And so I was asking myself um, like the same questions over and over and over again. I was asking myself, what is it that I love to do in my free time? What is it that actually uh, where I pay money for? What is it that kind of gets me emotionally or that, that really moves me emotionally? What is it that I talk with my friends about? What is it that already as a little kid that I was passionate about, that I loved? And it always came back to the same thing. It always came back to, even when I was a little kid, I was, already, I was always passionate about events that bring the whole world together, like the Olympic Games or the Soccer World Cup. Or if you're not into sports, if you go to a concert, for example, of your, of your favorite band or musician. When you're there, you're not thinking about, man, tomorrow I got to go to the hairdresser or I need to send a text message. Like you're totally there. You're totally in it. And and I I knew that was something that I want to work in. I didn't know yet what I actually wanted to do in that field, but I knew that this was the field that I want to be in. And then, so I, the whole thought process actually was then was evolving around that. And the next step was then also at that time um, from one of our professional soccer teams here in in Vienna, their youth teams were looking for a stadium announcer for their under 17-year-olds and under 19-year-olds. And since I knew some of their coaches from from sports university, they were actually recommending me and saying, hey, this guy, like, you want to do it? And I was like, sure, why not? And and so once... uh, a month on a Saturday afternoon, I was basically hosting two games, like playing some music, announcing the players, announcing some goal scorers, uh, like just having fun for, for 100, 150 people, like not a lot of people. It was just also not a lot of money that I got paid for it. I, 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 I got 70 euros, like wow. basically 70 bucks. Yeah. And I yeah. thought, man, I really hit it big. Like <laughs> I, I did it. <laughs> it was not about the money. It was just yeah. like, hey, I, I got the invitation for the Christmas party and I got season tickets for, for the big team. So that was like, yay, that was that was already the coolest thing about it. And but one year later, in 2009, it was the 25th of June 2009. That was the, the day that Michael Jackson died. I was on that evening at uh, at a party of the sports university. And when I left at 5.15 in the morning, I remember to, to this day that a friend of mine who worked at the professional ice hockey team, she left as well. And, and like 5.15 in the morning, the sun was up and, and we came off, it was on a boat, we came off the boat and I was like, hey, are you by any chance looking for a new stadium announcer for the ice hockey team? And she was, I have no idea, but I'll ask. She calls me the next day, you know what? We're looking for a stadium announcer. And I said, oh, wow, uh, that's cool. Then a few meetings with the manager later, he said, okay, you'll get your chance. And guess what? My first ever match that I saw live of that team, I was hosting it and playing the music. Holy like it was a total cow. Hail Mary, basically, if you, if you want to use football terms. It was either you learn very fast or you're out. But that was the first time I actually, for my, for myself, I had made the decision. This is what I want to do. I love doing that. And, and I want to grow in that area. I knew that there was a lot of things that I need to grow. 
but still there was something like all right the first thing i did was i invested my all of the money from my first year for a speaker's education and that's how it started wow oh man <laughs> i love that you just like full send just went for it make went the ask it. Yep. you never Respect. know what's going to come if you just That's make right. the ask and i mean you kind of got what you're looking for there which is great um I, I also can't even imagine the nerves that maybe you were feeling when you were doing that first game without having experienced that before or maybe that's an, like a false assumption on my part was it as easy for you as maybe it is now or were there a bunch of nerves attached to it well, I mean, it was not 100, 150 people anymore. It was suddenly like several thousand people that wow. were in the arena. And um, and there was an existing fan base. And if you've ever seen any European sports, in US sports, it's usually that the entertainment comes from the organization and it's for the fans. In Europe, oftentimes, it's the fans are the entertainment in a way. I mean, you're still going to have some entertainment, but the fans bring their own, like their chants and that like they, they do a lot of stuff by themselves. And you need to kind of organize with them in a way to, to succeed. Because if you don't have them behind you, it's not going to work. And that actually ties back to when you're, when you're speaking in front of an audience, you always need to know who is your audience? Who is it that you're actually talking to? Because it's all about their needs. It's about fulfilling their needs, not your own needs. Mm -hmm. Like you are there to serve their needs. And, and so I was meeting with them several times before the season opened with the, with the fan clubs. And, and then it was like, okay, let's see how this is going to go. I was enthusiastic about it and not very knowledgeable. But I was, I was willing to learn. And I think that's the attitude you need to bring. Because mm -hmm. if you're not willing to learn, man... It's going to be, it's going to go one way yeah. downhill. That's yeah, right. Right. Unless you get Stagnancy, lucky. Most you know. people don't though. So don't bet on luck. <laughs> yeah, for uh, sure. I'm also intrigued by, you said that like you, you started by going and getting like a, a speaker education. Can you tell us more about that? What does that mean? Well, it was um, like a voice education away as well, but really, mm. really for 14 months, I had a, it was called the school of speaking. So it was really about like training your voice and how to speak and how to articulate something, how to really like to, to use your, how do you learn how to use your voice as an instrument? How do you put an emphasis on something? Where do you make a break that is logical? Also, how is the melody that you're going to put into that resonates with somebody else? And also you learn like if you just change the tonality of a syllable, it might change the whole meaning of a sentence. Wow. And that's like, if you're speaking from stage and the, and the voice is your instrument, the better you're able to use your voice, the better you're going to be able to influence your audience and you want to influence them in a, in a positive way, in a good way. Yeah, man, that's so cool. I didn't even know that that kind of in organization existed <laughs> i yeah. mean like you know there's courses and you can go Stage take a stuff. webinar series and i know there's like public speaking curriculum and some universities and stuff but i mean it kind of makes sense that just the way that you said it right there it's similar to music i mean the nuance and how you play the music is how it impacts the audience it's what they feel you know it's not just about the notes it's how you play them and so Similar to that, it sounds like with your voice, it's not just the words themselves, but it's the way that they're delivered that makes the impact. Yeah. It, it's a lot more actually the way that they are that that they are delivered that makes the impact. Because I mean, think about it: you can hear the coolest thing in the world in terms of the content, but if it's totally dry, monotonous, and so on, you're you're gonna be fading off. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if it's it can be like some crazy stuff or some not so interesting stuff. But if the person who delivers it is really fun or engaging or you're like totally drawn into it, you're going to pay attention and, and you might even have fun. And having <laughs> fun and getting the emotions involved has a lot to do in how you present something, not what you present. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Super insightful. So something that I've been thinking about, especially as we were prepping for the show, learning about your background is I mean, getting in front of thousands, tens of thousands, if not millions of people, especially with your TV background. Like, 
does the performance change based on the size of the audience? Do you find that it's different presenting, engaging, you know, ma the masses versus, let's say, a smaller group of people? Yes and no. Okay. In, in general, the performance is always going to change, but it's not so much about the audience. Uh, it's not so much about the size of the audience, but okay. about who is your audience. Okay. And what is this about? What is the event about? So basically, uh, since I also do a lot of sports, you're going to have a different performance if you're a ring announcer in boxing and standing in a ring and, and introducing some players in the, in the red corner and in the, in the blue corner and so on. It's going to be very different than when you are basically presenting or having an interview on TV, for example, when you're introducing somebody. Yeah. Or also, even when you stay in a world of sports, every different sports has a different identity. And if you're speaking at an event, it's really, really, really imminent that you know what is the outcome of the event and also who is the audience. Like, who am I talking to? Because if you go somewhere and you are like, I know everything, I'm just going to tell them the world and they are going to be awed and I don't care who it is. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. So it's really going to be your performance is going to be depending on your audience. One more thing, as you were saying, like in terms of size of, of the audience, what of yeah. course can be that there is a certain threshold in your, in your mind, like with Luke and Yoda in, in Star Wars, where it was like, well, moving stones around is one thing, but this is totally different when it was about to move to start like the ship. Yeah. And, and, and Yoda said, no different it is, only different in your mind. Uh -huh. And so also when it, it's the same thing, if you're talking in front of five people, 50 people or 50,000 people at a time, you need That's to bring the energy. Yeah. It's about you resonating with somebody else and you're not talking to 50,000 people at the same time. You're talking one-to-one -one times 50,000. Whoa. That's wow. a cool perspective. Wow. Well, first off, hats off to the analogy to Star Wars. Right? Super awesome. That really clicked with me. I don't know about you listeners out there, so that really landed. But yeah, the shift of one-to-one -one times 50,000. I have never, never thought about it that way. That was paradigm shifting for me, Ronnie. True. You know, one of my favorite like public speaking figures, controversial figure, I will say, but is Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson talks about how like <clears throat> when you're talking to a big audience, you're still engaging with the audience and getting feedback from them, but it's through different mediums. Like if you make eye contact with people, their demeanor will tell you about whether they're locked in and interested or bored, or if they're excited, or if they're fidgeting and talking to their neighbors or looking at their phone, like you're getting constant feedback. You're just looking at different signals for that feedback relative to a small audience where you have people raise their hand and tell you what they're thinking. So do you find that that's true? Or are you just looking for different things in the audience to be able to give that one-to-one -one feeling, even if maybe you're not having a two-way conversation with an individual? Well, if it's possible, and if the size of the people actually allows it, dare to ask. Dare to ask your audience. Dare to engage them directly. Mm -hmm. Dare to address them directly. And because you're going to get some feedback, even like if it's just five or 50 people, it's going to be very easy to ask them one-on-one -on -one or like to, to really look them in the eye and say something. If you're in a stadium in front of 50,000 people, your engagement is going to look different. But still, I'm going to ask the audience. Like I'm going to ask them, where are the fans of whatever, like of, of whoever the team is and so on. But I'm, I'm going to say it with certainty. Like mm. I mean it. Because here's the thing. Does any one of you have, have pets or a dog? Yeah. Yep. Both yeah. Us. And you know, a dog, they can feel, like they can feel if you're certain, if you're scared, if you're fearful, whatever it is, they, they can feel how you are. And when you're in a stadium and you got hundreds or tens of thousands of people looking at you, this is, it's like a wild beast. In a way, it's really, they can feel if you are certain, they can feel if you take direction, if you take command, 
or if you're fearful. Hmm. They can feel that. So you need to connect with your inner certainty. You need to connect with your own certainty. And if you're, if you're like, Jesus, I'm, I'm freaked out of my mind. Before you go out there, think about a time where you felt completely certain, where you totally were there. Like really get yourself in that space. Connect with that space before you go out there and talk with them that you can deliver from a totally different perspective than when you go out there like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm freaking out. Oh my God, I don't know what to say. I'm totally blank. You don't want to go there. Really go breathe deep, connect, and then go out and speak. Man, I love that. Internal work right there. Internal work, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Man, so holy cow. what about some of like the other like preparation tactics that you might use? I, yeah. I'm interested to hear too if it's different for a smaller audience than a bigger audience as well, since you have such good expertise in both areas. But like you know, that's one awesome thing that you just described is getting into that proper headspace before you get out there. But what are some of the other things that you do before a big performance that you use to feel confident going into it? I'm going to take one thing that you just said before and then tie it into the preparation because you were saying about like internally. To prepare internally. Yes, you prepare yourself internally so that you can show up and be completely externally. Because when you are out there with an audience, no matter what the size is, you want to be present. You need to feel them. You need to see where they're at. That means your focus is not in your own mind, in your head. Your focus should be with them. It should be really with them to take them on a journey, to take them on an experience, on an emotional experience. You want to, basically, you want to know where you want to take them. I'll give an example. When we have um, the Austin national team in soccer, and for, for the last 12 years, I've been doing the Austin Cup final in soccer, but also the national team games. And before we actually started working together, we were thinking about the process. We're thinking, well, okay, what is our outcome? And that's actually also tying back into every event. What is your outcome? Like, what is it that you want to achieve? Also, what is it that the person who hires you to speak wants to achieve? So first step, what is the outcome? And of course, our outcome in the entertainment was, well, okay, our outcome is we got from doors open to kickoff, it's two hours. Wow. That means our outcome is, to have the fans on fire by the time the ball kicks off. So we have the two hours to build the emotional bridge, to build it there. It's not going to be that they are coming, like that they are already on fire, maybe, but you still want to like get them there. You want to like heat it up. Then the second question I always ask is, who is my audience? Who is it? Who is it that I'm actually talking to? And before we came on the podcast here, I actually uh, asked you exactly those two right. things. What's the outcome? And also, who is the, is the target audience? Wow. And so I want to know everything I can about the audience. Like, for example, with the, with the soccer uh, example again, or with the sports example, I want to know who are those people? What is going on inside of them? What is their emotional involvement? Why are they here? Where are they before? Are they maybe, are they coming from the office? Are they maybe here because they have to be there? Or are they there because they love it? And, and once again, uh, think about the stadium experience. Are they there? Like, what's going on today? Is this going to be a big game? Or is this going to be a game that doesn't matter? Like, uh, like is it going to be a Super Bowl or is it going to be preseason? And it's going to be quite different how people show up. If your team is in a Super Bowl, you're going to be super hyped for, for two weeks since you know that they're in the Super Bowl already. Like, you're going to be basically on the playoff train. Like, yeah, oh, my God. If it's preseason, you go to a preseason game, it's like, all right, <laughs> let's have some fun. Let's have some hot dogs or whatever you want to have there. And, it's, 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 and you got to know this as the person who is there. And you got to know, are they there because of you? Are you the main act? Or are they there? Or are you just a bridge? Or like, what is your role in that? Mm -hmm. And then, um, well, and then when, when I know that, I can go to, okay, what's my call to action in terms of preparation? Like, what do, if, if I speak somewhere, what is it that at the end 
of the event that I, what is the feeling that I want to leave them behind with? What is the feeling that I want them to leave the stadium, that I want them to leave the event? And, and I go from there and then I work backwards. How do I start into it? And then how to build it up to get to where I want to go. Wow. Man, <laughs> succinct. You have Hopefully a process dialed. What I love about what you just broke down is it was, it was super meta because bef- like you're right, Ronnie, before the show, you asked us all of these things. And, and so you were treating even just this podcast as an event. And we're three, three guys hanging out, talking about the business versus a 50,000 person stadium show that you're about to do. It was the same process that you followed. So it, it, like the size of that audience doesn't, it doesn't change your process at all, which does, was really does, cool. To it does before. not, Taylor, because yeah. here's the point. You always want to know who your audience is. Yeah. Because if you don't know who it is and what the outcome is, like if it's a different audience or a different outcome, I'm going to talk about different things or maybe at a different Correct. angle. Yeah, right. It's something that's so simple that's so easy to take for granted. Because I mean, and this is especially true for the people that are seasoned, because you really do start to take it for granted. It's routine. You're just doing right. the same thing every single time. But that's not the right angle, because you're leaving value on the table for the people that you could connect with better if you were to take a second to stop and slow down and figure out how you can make those little tweaks and changes to whatever you're delivering so that people get more value out of it. And I mean, it sounds like this is true, not even just for the size of the audience, but for the different mediums in which you're getting in front of people, whether you're like hosting a gigantic stadium or whether you're on a podcast like this, I imagine it's the exact same if you're getting on stage to deliver a keynote. So like if you're, if you're getting in front of people, it sounds like the core thing that you're saying is like, understand what they want so that you can give that to them. (laughs) Is that fair? Even if you're writing a book. For example, yeah. I would still treat it the same way. Or if I'm, if I'm going to deliver a seminar, it's, it's going to be different. It's not going to be maybe an hour or something. It's going to be maybe two days or something. But still, I need to know what's my outcome. What's my outcome? Then I can break it down into days. But also, what it, like, who is my audience? And then for every day, what is the outcome of the day? And what is, what is going to be the end goal of every day? And then I can work it backwards. Yeah, that's right. Simple. Yeah. And that just yep. helps with the preparation of all of it. You know, you go in with that conviction, that internal work, like you're there, you show up, you're 100%. I mean, when you know what you're there to do and who you're there to serve, it maybe is less difficult to get in front of those larger audiences. I just had a guy um, who I was helping. He was a CEO of a company and, and he was he was creating his first keynote speech. Okay. And... Uh, and it basically, we had two and a half meetings. Like it was first a Zoom call, and then we had two live meetings. But it was like, okay, how? Are, like on a Zoom call, it was just about basically structuring to help him structure his ideas. Because I'll, and again, asking those questions like, what's your outcome, and and who's your audience? And just by those questions, he completely restructured what he originally had in mind. So then when we had the first real meeting, he completely had changed everything because he went down that path the right way. And then when we met, it was, okay, let's go through the content. Let's see how we can even work on that to make it even more smooth, to make it even more better for your, for your target audience. And then the last step, the, the next meeting was all about performance. Like how nice. can we enhance your performance? How can we make it that you are more engaging? How can we make it that you are even better serving them and still being yourself? Because it's not about putting on a mask when you're up on a, on a stage. It's not about being somebody else or being a copy of somebody, but it's about, of course, it's awesome to take, to take different things from different people that you admire, that, you, that are role models. And at the same time, when you're out there, you need to find who is, who is it inside of you that you want to be. You need to create yeah. yourself. Oof, man. That's powerful right there. For I sure. that in my heart, Ronnie. For real. <laughs> Holy cow, man. I feel like we could be here for hours talking about this stuff. <laughs> Ronnie, what a cool episode. I thank you for sharing your perspective, your experience, the life you've lived. It's really, really cool stuff. If someone wants to learn more, they want to connect with you, like what's the best way for them to do that? First of all, um, RonnieLieber.com. I guess um, we're going to have it in the show notes. And, and also there, like there's an English version of my website and, and there's a blog on it. So basically there are many topics that we talked about also on the blog. 
and or write me a message. At the same time, you can also, of course, hit me up on social media, on, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Facebook, slash Ronnie Lieber, and you will find me there. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure all of those links are in the show notes. Ronnie, thank you again for, com for coming on the show today. And guys, if you like this episode, don't forget to rate it, like it, subscribe to it. And if you want more awesome resources like this, go to speakerflow.com slash resources. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. Check the show notes for more info and see you next time. Later.